Matthew Continetti, welcome to the realignment. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for coming. So we brought you on because we wanted to talk about an op-ed you wrote last week. It was about how the coronavirus may or may not actually change the nature of conservatism. And something I appreciate about the op-ed before we sort of dive into it was, you know, you weren't exactly arguing that every single thing you were writing in the piece was going to result in those changes. And just, and that was this also this idea that we should be humble. Um, but we're really interested in exploring some of those different possibilities. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So just to start off in everything, I think what interested me was sort of this idea that the coronavirus might not actually change anything about conservatism. Instead, it may actually just sort of accelerate trends that were already present beforehand. So what are some of those examples for you? Sure. Well, I uh, was inspired to write the piece by a lot of arguments that um, the coronavirus represents an end, whether that end is Donald Trump's presidency, could be, or whether it's the end of Trumpism, which I'm less certain of. But so this kind of uh, opposition to an idea of ending made me think, well, maybe it's just a continuation of things that have already been taking place. And clearly, uh, you guys have been following, I've been following for some time, the emergence of a group of intellectuals and Capitol Hill staffers who are very much interested in rethinking conservatism along lines that more oriented toward what they call the common good or more toward a um, uh, more active role uh, for the state, uh, certainly in economic policy. Um, and I think, I suspect uh, that uh, recent events will um, kind of uh, cause those trends to, to uh, quicken. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I appreciated about what you said is that Trumpism at its best, it symbolizes a suspicion of overseas commitments, international trade, unchecked migration, and a focus on China not Russia in particular, whenever it comes. I guess if we could crystallize it at, at its intellectual core, that, that might be one version of what it is. So what is it about the coronavirus crisis that naturally lends itself to that that might be staying as a staying force? Because there's a lot of debate right now, Matt, about the staying power of so much of whatever our consumer economy is right now, so much of our politics, is it temporary or is it lasting? How, how have you thought about that broadly? Right. No, I think that's uh, important for why I said it was, we should have some intellectual modesty because we really don't know. I mean, this situation is remarkably unprecedented. The last global pandemic, if you think of the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, was in a different universe. I mean, the federal government was much, much smaller People didn't have the same expectations of government performance, of a global co economy. They didn't even really have the same expectations of, of life, to be frank. They lived much more tragic lives. Um, children died earlier. People weren't expected to live long. So now the coronavirus hits us, and we have not only a global economy that demands the attention of all of our elites constantly, but we also have uh, much greater expectations um, not only for government's role, but also for government's capabilities. And we don't have a tragic sense of life. We have a therapeutic sense of life. We, we don't expect things to turn badly very quickly. We don't expect people to begin dropping dead due to nature. And yet that's precisely what's happening. And so because this situation is so novel, uh, I'm not sure we can say definitively what will come out of it. That said, I mean, look at where, where, what got us to this place. I mean, the uh, virus originated in China. It was allowed to spread because the Chinese Communist Party covered up, lied about it. Um, uh, and it kind of is um, almost designed to, um, to work in the weak spots of uh, globalization. So the uh, global supply chain, which is a strength, actually now turns into the transmission mechanism. And our, our outsourcing of industry puts Americans uh, in a position where we wonder, well, why are we having these shortages of masks? Why can't we produce ventilators? So in the, to the degree that the coronavirus highlights the threat of the Communist Party ruling in China, uh, 
to the degree that it suggests that outsourcing is not an unallowed, unalloyed good, um, and, and to the degree that it suggests that global interconnectedness could be a liability as much as it could be a benefit, I think it will make um, young people in particular experiencing this uh, really kind of say, well, Trumpism, as you said, or as I described, I mean, it's not going to go away. Yeah, and something I'd like to get into then is this formulation of Trumpism that you put forward. And and sort of the key phrase you said was sort of at best, Trumpism could represent these sort of things. So I think the first part of my question is, what does sort of the what what sort of at worst would Trumpism represent? Um sort of in the face of a crisis like this. Um and then secondly, what part of that good part of Trumpism is really going to be strengthened, do you think, by what's happened here? Sure. Well, I mean, I think there are plenty of things, examples of Trumpism at its worst. I mean, I, I do think we have seen um, the kind of anti-elitism that's certainly part of national populism can easily go too far uh, and when, when people just begin to kind of, you know, doubt public health authorities, not because they know science or statistics or epidemiology, just because well, we don't like authorities, right, if we're populists. And so everyone must be wrong. Everyone must be playing Trump, you know. On the other hand, Trump is doing what these authorities say, which suggests that he is listening to them and is, uh, I think, reasonably frightened by what they're telling him. Uh, so I think that's a downside of Trumpism. Certainly, uh, uh, we saw also, I think, um, Trump caution against um, turning prejudicial against Asian Americans uh, because of the viral uh, because of the viral spread, and I think that would be a, a bad manifestation of Trumpism, xenophobia, uh, racism, bigotry. So there are many examples of bad Trumpism, and I'm not writing the column to suggest that you know Trumpism is good or even that the kind of course historical course that I outline in the column is a good will would be a good development. Um, but um, the, and then there's a larger question of, you know, um, kind of America's uh, stance toward the world, right? And so while I believe personally that China is our greatest threat and that we are in the beginning stages of the second Cold War and that this will last for decades and really the issue will be, is America going to remain a global power or not? Or will we just cede it to China? That doesn't mean we turn our back on the entire world. And so there in Trumpism, or rather in the presidency of Trump, there has been kind of a, I would say kind of a couture in dealing with our traditional allies, uh, specifically those in Europe, that I think we might come to regret in situations like this. Yeah, Matt, and one of the things I, I enjoyed about your column was about the forward-looking nature of it. And and what one of the important things about being humble about any particular moment is about understanding what needs to happen for political change to actually occur. And so, you know, you've talked about these younger senators and Senate staffers. I mean, I don't think it's a secret where I stand on this thing. But one of the things that I have always criticized about nascent political movements is their lack of recognition of how much actual work that goes into this. Do you see the actual groundwork laid in terms of populist legislation, staffers, talent pools, and all that, that is actually capable of carrying this political moment across the finish line in 2024, if it were to, if, if it's even possible to do so? Well, I don't think it's there yet, Sagar. I mean, I think that's clear. I mean, this is a very nascent uh, tendency, and I'm not sure how long it will last, to be honest. I think a lot of what um, is contributing to this realignment that you guys are devoting your podcast to and, and that we've all been following is kind of a, um, an ambivalence or uncertainty about the meaning of our current moment. Um, did 20, was 2016 and Donald Trump's victory a fluke, or did it represent something much larger um, more significant and long lasting. And there are plenty of people in Washington, as we all know, who think that it's a fluke, that it was a fluke. And that once Trump leaves the scene, whether that is next January or whether that's in January of 25, um, politics will kind of revert to the status quo anti Trump and uh, everybody 
will be back in their normal um, ideological camps. Now, I have come to the conclusion that it was not a fluke, that even if it was a very close run thing, which it was, that was probably more due to Donald Trump's personal weaknesses uh, than it was to um, the, the themes of his candidacy and their power, I think, over um, a, a broad section of the electorate. And so when you think uh, through, when we begin, begin to think through what might come after Trump, um, there still needs to be a, a lot more um, intellectual work done. And also kind of, again, recognizing the pitfalls of, um, of national populism, the weaknesses of it, and avoiding those weaknesses, which are self-limiting. On the other hand, as I also said in the column, uh, it could well be uh, that if the Republicans find themselves out of power next year, uh, con conservatives will very quickly rediscover their their love of limited government and their opposition to spending and their opposition to deficits. And so this kind of common good conservatism, to use Marco Rubio's phrase, uh, will be kind of just that, a, a kind of a Philip, uh, because you know um, all of a sudden Nikki Haley will look like the big hero because she um, left the Boeing board, won't, you know, didn't want to accept a bailout, and she's defending capitalism in the pages of the Wall Street Journal. We just don't know, but I do, I am of the view um, that national populism is a, is a response to very deep-seated changes in, um, in, in, the, in basically global politics and global society, uh, and those won't be going away anytime soon. So I think what would be useful for our listeners is if we could survey the landscape, right? So you were making references to these, you know, heterodox conservatives in the Senate. You know, we're making reference to sort of like intellectual movements. So we're thinking of, you know, Senators Tom Cotton, Senator Marco, um, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Josh Hawley, representatives like Mike Gallagher, most of whom we had on, had on the podcast before, of course, and also journals like American Affairs. So what, just sort of summarize how you sort of interpret this sort of broad movement. Or just who is in it? Well, you gave a very good uh, rundown. Um, I think um, I think Cotton has been kind of uh, a leading indicator on a lot of these issues. Uh, in 2016, uh, he very quickly, I think, understood what Trump represented. And Tom had already been a, um, a hawk on immigration. And so I think being hawkish on immigration kind of made people more aware of what was happening with, with the Trump candidacy. And I think he took, he, he, uh, Tom has laid down a big marker um, in terms of his uh, bill to kind of resource the medical and pharmaceutical supply chain back to the United States. And he's very good at like kind of laying these markers down. For example, his letter to the mullahs, uh, you know, in 2014, uh, saying, or 2015, saying that uh, the next president can nullify the Iran deal. He was, he was right. And in fact, Senator Cotton and his staff were the first to kind of alert me to what was happening in China and the seriousness of coronavirus. Josh Hawley is fascinating um, and uh, definitely a rising star. And it's really um, impressive to me how quickly he has kind of gone from, um, you know, uh, an attorney general, a state attorney general, someone very much associated with the establishment side of the Republican Party. Um, uh, prior to his elective office, even though uh, he has, a, you know, he, he was writing for National Affairs pretty early on. So he's always kind of had a heterodox view of, of uh, classical liberalism. Um, but he's very quickly been able to put policy chops on a lot of his ideas. And now he's been spent most of his time focusing on tech. But I think um, now with coronavirus, that may change and, and thinking more about China. And he's, he's been doing that, too. Uh, Rubio's kind of um, made these series of speeches last year on common good capitalism or, um, and common good conservatism. He's been more on the pro-industrial policy side of things, where Holly's been kind of more on the antitrust, anti-monopoly side. And what is common good conservatism or common good capitalism? Uh, well, I think that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to figure it out myself. Um, but I think it has to do with, uh, as, I, as one of Senator Rubio's aides once put it to me, it's about using political power for um, the public interest rather than private interest. Now, this is a long running theme. I mean, you can go back and look in earlier conservatives or neoconservatives 
who thought that as much as they supported the free market understood that it was there were limitations to it and that uh, a successful Republican Party was going to kind of have to um, transcend some of free market dogma in order to think politically, in order to think about uh, uh, having an agenda that shapes the future and therefore appeals to, to constituent groups. And I think common good conservatism or common good capitalism is a way of doing that. More specifically, uh, Rubio's ideas include kind of an opposition to stock buybacks, um, a kind of criticism of the so-called financialization of the economy. Uh, I'm less with him on those things. Uh, but um, but that that's kind of where where his head is at. Um, so that's in the Senate. Um, th those are kind of the young senators who I think have taken this moment of kind of um, rather the pre-coronavirus moment of policy drift. You know, they weren't so the Senate's a wonderful writers' colony. You know, they it, they have to come in every one, every week to to vote in the judges. But otherwise, up until the past month or so, they hadn't been doing much. Um, and then there's, of course, intellectually. So you see uh, in First Things, and you see in American Affairs, and you see in the American Mind website put up by Claremont, and you see on Twitter, of course, a lot of people, young people in particular, um, kind of gesturing toward a conservatism um, that is uh, less about private enterprise, less about the free market, and more about uh, serving uh, the new Republican base of uh, working class voters, uh, which is un which are understood to be voters without college degrees. So, Matt, I mean, let's also be fair to the people on the other side. Who are the, you mentioned Nikki Haley, who are some of the, I guess, the big defenders of an old, more free market order, of a more libertarian ideology um, that are emerging and are staunchly defending that in lieu of this new movement that we talk a lot about here on the podcast and those senators there as well? Of course. Well, uh, just in the Senate, I think uh, Pat Toomey is a great example of someone who is definitely a um, free market conservative, uh, I'm going to say a Wall Street Journal editorial board conservative. Um, and that's a very, you know, a strong uh, intellectual anchor, you know, um, the supply side has been developed over decades. Um, and it has answers to a lot of questions. Um, and we kind of see the power of the supply side um, thought and doctrine uh, in um, how influential the economists Art Laffer and Stephen Moore have been, um, at least until yesterday, on President Trump's eagerness to get the economy back. Um, and we're, we're all eager to get the economy back. This question is the cost of that in health um, and in the economy. Uh, obviously, the, the syndicated columnist George Will, um, who, you know, uh, 30 years ago when I was born would probably be on the other side of this debate. Um, if um, He now uh, has kind of really come to a libertarian understanding of a lot of these questions. Uh, and he has been, he's um, Senator Hawley's, inter, uh, you know, most notable interlocutor, interlocutor for sure. And so I think then, um, you know, and then the kind of the never Trumpers play an interesting role in this too, because, um, they they are um, they're not so much involved in this interconservative debate, but they do represent a kind of a pre-Trump understanding of conservatism, which was that uh, basically conservatives, these conservative mainstream, in rejecting Pat Buchanan, had come to uh, uh, the position that globalization was good, global interconnectedness was good, the global economy, free trade, free flows of labor, capital and um, commodities were all good things that conservatives should defend. And so the never Trumpers, even as they're somewhat uh, uh, removed, I think, from the conservative movement, still represent that point of view um, very well. And you mentioned libertarians, which is a good sort of pivot into Tyler Cowen's work, because Tyler Cowen's someone who sort of is forging this third way between sort of the libertarianism of the past. He's a professor at George Mason University um, at the Mercatus Center, but that also sort of brings in sort of the state capacity libertarianism. You wrote about that in the column. So articulate how that could be a sort of thing people pick up. Yeah, uh, Tyler Cowen's a fascinating uh, economist, kind of a polymath. He describes himself as an infovore. I'm sure many of your listeners or viewers are familiar with him. 
and he runs this blog, Marginal Revolution, which I've been reading for years, many people read it. And in January, he had a post on something he called State Capacity Libertarianism. And I think it was, uh, it was his own thought experiment that he turned into a blog, but then it also is, I think as he said in a subsequent interview, it is related to some of the thinking of his kind of um, friend and, and kind of um, you know, intellectual companion in some ways, Peter Thiel, the, the, the venture capitalist which is, well, you know, recognizing that markets are important and that individual freedom is a consequence of human dignity. And if you believe in human dignity and protecting it, you also believe in protecting individual liberty. That's kind of how I understand it anyway, and what, what I believe. Um, there has to be some position for that. On the other hand, and he's speaking really toward the libertarian movement in this blog, libertarians tend to, um, uh, have such a suspicion of the state that they don't recognize its value. Um, and so he kind of came, his, its value in certain respects. And so he put forward this idea of state capacity libertarianism, which um, he, she says might be a, a new fusion of uh, economic conservatism and uh, maybe some of the concerns of social conservatism. And I do think a lot of our discussions, not just Tyler Cowen, not just uh, Josh Hawley, um, is kind of a, a desire for a new fusionism, a new ground for the conservative movement. Um, uh, and, and, and until we find that new ground, um, we, we, we're in a very unstable situation. Quickly, just for the, uh, for the listeners and the viewers, what is state capacity libertarianism? Well, I think if you read uh, Tyler Cowen's post on the subject, which I hope we'll link to, um, it will you'll see that state capacity libertarianism is a form of libertarian politics. That is a politics that puts a premium or uh, an importance on individual liberty, individual freedom, but also recognizes that government uh, needs to do things. Uh, and, you know, the libertarians have always kind of conceded government needs to keep order, right? Um, rule of law. But the state capacity libertarians might add that government also needs to build roads conduct research and technology, maybe help fund a space program through prizes and um, uh, incentives, you know. Um, these things that are go beyond the more uh, minimal government uh, conception of libertarianism. They don't turn into liberalism, uh, but they still have, um, they still are government um, interventions in the economy uh, and society, basically to build up um, social, social institutions. Um, so he, he mentions infrastructure, critical infrastructure, one might say critical technologies. One could also add the education system. Um, so it's kind of a, a new fusion of, um, of economic liberalism and kind of a, and not some social conservatism so much because you don't have to be it, but definitely a, an appreciation of a role for government in economy and society. Hmm. One of the things you mentioned there is that the results, I guess, is that there, there's an opening for state capacity libertarianism if the recession, if the results are widespread in the recession. Why do you think that is? Why, what is it about this, that the, the coronavirus and the subsequent effect that might give that more of an opening? Because I saw state capacity libertarianism as a fundamental you know, realization of defeat. Uh, and I think, I think Tyler even said that in his column, which is, look, the libertarian moment is dead. Um, as, as, as we originally conceived it, this is the only way forward. What is it about this crisis that could give it some bolstering in the future? Because I think you're quite right. I think it has both the elements um, of that, that some of the GOP order could coalesce around. I just want to dig into that in particular. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, even though it might, the idea might have come out of the uh, failure of a libertarian moment, I actually think the coronavirus will make certain people more appreciative of liberty. I mean, I know I, I'm more appreciative of liberty. I'm stuck in a house with my family. And, uh, you know, and uh, so I'd like to go out. Um, on the other hand, even though we, we can see the value of freedom, we also recognize as a necessity of the state. If we're going to try to keep this, this pandemic under control, uh, it requires a real reevaluation of civil liberties mass testing, contact tracing, isolation of affected populations or at-risk populations. 
so so the crisis kind of elevates both freedom and the, the need for a state. And so that's why I kind of thought that the Tyler Cowen's formulation of state capacity libertarianism is, is kind of appropriate to the moment. So we've sort of been surveying where at least the sort of start of the coronavirus outbreak has left various movements. Where does this leave sort of the progressive Bernie Sanders left? Because there have been a couple of folks such as Ross Douthat, Shadi Hamid at The Atlantic, who have sort of pointed out that the last time anyone's going to want to sort of have a revolution that overturns everything is a moment sort of like this. So do you think if this is going to be this sort of historical black swan that's going to sort of put a stop to that sort of leftward drift or at least more revolutionary drift, or is there going to have a different effect? You know, I've, I've been struck guys by uh, how little coronavirus has changed the thinking of a lot of people. And, you know, I wrote my column about what it might, its effects downstream, but the truth is, uh, if you just look at partisan politics, people are still arguing. Um, it, it took a while to get that bill, perhaps too long, across the finish line, the phase three legislation. Um, the people who hate Trump, oh, they still hate Trump. The people who love Trump, they still love Trump. Um, Bernie Sanders' folks, I'd imagine, think that what's happening is, a, is reason for Bernie and his program. I, at the Outside of the crisis, not so much. I got uh, not so much today. I got a lot of questions saying to let you know, from lefties or liberals, you know, don't we need state-run health care because of coronavirus? And I think people will continue to have that um, response. I, I disagree with it. I think I think our private um, or our, our mixed system of health uh, research and provision uh, will be the thing that gets us through this. But and nonetheless, I I don't see any change in that. In, in the thinking there. And then of course, I've been, I've, I mean, I'm collecting examples for a future piece of kind of the cultural left's response, which is hilarious. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, they're, they're, it's done, coronavirus has done nothing to change their thinking. This is the New York Times had a piece a couple of weeks ago talking about how you know, the tragedy that now a gender reassignment surgery won't, uh, you know, are pushed back. Um, and the constant kind of, or what was the CNN article saying, you know, the lack of diversity in Trump's uh, public health team, right? Um, right. So they're still, the cultural left is still going to interpret these things the, the way they always have. So um, I would say I don't really agree with them that this is the end of anything. And I would also caution that the, uh, the response, I, I do think once it's over, people are already just so eager to get back to normal, right? Um, that people will e kind of easily go back to the roles they inhabited before the crisis. And that's why I wrote my piece, because I was saying when they get back to that position, though, they may find that certain trends haven't been stopped so much as accelerated. And so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll start our debate on China at a very different place at the end of this than where the debate was before. Um, and I, I look at some of the pieces being written uh, in recent days about how this crisis shows how, how we need to get nicer to China. And it just baffles me. I mean, I, I, just, I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I never, I, I, I used to think about like, what is it like to live through a time when things, a historic time when things are changing? And as you say, the politics hasn't all changed that much. People, you know, some people are still saying stupid things that they were before, even though they know the better, the, the same partisanship still, still seems to remain. I guess the question is, is on the debate. Um, with China in particular, obviously that's something we focus on here. Why is it that you're so certain that there will be enough ground? Because there seems, as you said, there's still quite a bit of denialism that happens in the mainstream media. We see, you know, current uh, we see current citation of Chinese death numbers as just admissions of fact when we obviously know that's not the case. Do you think that the ground has changed all that much, or is it that this crisis will need to accelerate? significantly more in order to cause that change that you're talking about? Well, I think if, again, you know, and I, I tend to study the right more than anything else, but if you look at the Republican Party, I'd say that a lot of Republican lawmakers are, are already beginning to sound more hawkish on China mm -hmm. than they were before. And I think that's really what I mean by kind of where the position will change. And, um, and I do, th and, you know, it's fascinating to me for, um, 
the, uh, the Rubio legislation with Collins, the small business lending. And he was able to get that in the bill. That is a significant kind of uh, conceptual breakthrough. You know, the government is now where the, we'll be lending. Um, and when you think about the Overton window, right, um, even if we don't want this to be a permanent situation, you know, um, that, that idea has been introduced. And so for Republicans who are interested in kind of in, uh, pushing uh, for a more unorthodox uh, GOP economic policy, they've, they've, well, they had, a small, they had a big victory there that they'll, mm -hmm. they'll be able to build on. But you're right. For the the rest of the world, they're probably not <laughs> they're probably not going to change all that. And, and I do I do wonder. I mean, what this has done to Joe Biden's campaign, for example, it's like that. To just get back to the previous idea of what this does to Sanders, I'm not sure. I don't think this kills Sanders. The the primaries are all delayed. Biden's in his basement. Voters are going to have to think about. Well, do we really want to put Joe Biden in charge of this? Even if you know, even if the people come to a um, uh, well, Democrats are already there. Democrats don't like Trump's response. Um, so, but do they really think that Joe Biden would do any better? I'm, I'm not so sure. Yeah, and that's interesting because, you know, we've all seen the polls. President Trump's approval ratings have gone up. So it just seems that I think the recurring story throughout this entire sort of realignment period, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, or whether it's real or fake, is that Trump's the ultimate confounding variable here. And that whatever is going to basically happen is going to sort of be – you can sort of wake up one day and think another thing, you can wake up another and think a different thing than that entirely. So I think to sort of finish up, I think my last real question here is, if you're someone who thinks there's a chance that we could go back to the pre, to the sort of, step to the status quo before 2016, what do you think is going to need to happen in the next few months, not in terms of the epidemiology or like sort of the medical thing, but what sort of norms or returns are we going to need to sort of see, do you think? If you want to get back to the pre-2016 conservatism? Yeah, because I think Sagar and I would argue that, yeah. Uh, you'd be hoping for a democratic victory in the fall. Really? Yeah, I do. Because that would be, I'm just, if history is any guide, that would be the thing that makes the Republican Party decide to be for limited government again, <laughs> because all of a sudden you'd be in opposing everything that the Democratic administration and Congress is trying to put forward. And so you could have the, the, um, the basis for uh, a renewal of limited government conservatism, at least in the, in the immediate, you know, to, to midterm. Um, otherwise, I'm not so sure because, um, you know, the, 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 to me, the most powerful force is, I think I said, driving Trump in 2016 was, was immigration and kind of all that immig immigration has kind of become to me anyway, kind of the, the master issue because it, 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 uh, there's a lot of cultural concerns in there. There's economics, there's national security. It's all, it's all in one. Um, and if you just look at the polls of Republicans, uh, the entire party has moved to where Trump is on immigration. So there's no going back there. But in a Democratic administration, I do think uh, the Republicans who run uh, for Congress uh, in 2022 would be saying, we have to stop these deficits. You know, we have to get Joe Biden spending under control. You know, um, and, and they, if, again, if history is any guide, they'd probably have some success in the midterms against a Democratic incumbent. And I, I, I actually lied. I, I do have one more question that your answer brought up. Um, how do you think the sort of Great Recession, how did the Great Recession change conservatism, right? Because sort of the underlying thing we haven't really talked about here isn't just COVID-19. It's the fact that we are in a recession right now or, or are about to go into one. So what ways did sort of the 2008-2009 period change the trajectory of the movement in a way that should inform how we think about today? You know, again, I, I, I think of it more in terms of kind of um, accelerating certain things that were already there. So, uh, you know, if you think of, for me anyway, um, the kind of fire bell in the night was Sarah Palin in 2008, I wrote a whole book about it. And, um, so Palin happens. She kind of, her worst interview throughout that whole campaign was with Katie Kirk, where she clearly didn't understand the economic crisis or how to respond to it. Uh, and then, and then McCain and Palin are defeated in a way. You think, okay, well, that's the end of that. Well, it wasn't, because who emerged as kind of the queen of the Tea Party? It was Palin when she started talking about the death panels, right, in the next summer. Um, and 
and kind of the conservatism we send the rebellions against George W. Bush at the end of his presidency, right? If you think about the Ron Paul phenomenon, it was anti-war. If you think about the opposition to Bush's immigration reforms, okay, anti-immigration, the protests against the Doha, or rather the Dubai ports deal, right? Okay, mm -hmm. that's anti-trade. All right, well, so there you have it. There you have the, the kind of this persistent strain in American conservatism that was building on the grassroots right all throughout this. And then that ma manifested itself eventually in 2016. Um, so, so yeah, so the, 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 the changes there um, were, were simply accelerated up and up until uh, up until 2016 and I think that the same thing will happen um, today that's interesting well I certainly hope so uh, but uh, Matt we really appreciate you joining us it's been an excellent interview really great column we encourage everybody to go uh, and check it out we'll make sure we include a, a link in the description so thank you Matt really appreciate it thank you thanks Joel. for coming stay stay well you too, too.